This is the Kratom Science Journal Club with Dr. Jonathan Cachet, neuroscientist and expert in psychopharmacology. In each episode, we discuss an article in a peer-reviewed journal. I'm your host, Brian Gallagher, blog and social media writer for KratomScience.com, your source for all things Kratom. This week, we look at a study by a team from University of Florida called Lyophilize Kratom Tea as a Therapeutic Option for Opioid Dependence. The science is catching up with what thousands of Kratom consumers are saying, that Kratom can be a safe and effective harm reduction tool for opioid withdrawal and dependence. Like, okay, wait a minute. I got the definition here. I don't know if you're going to hear it, but... Lyophilize. Did you hear that? Wow, I would have not said it like that. Lyophilized. Okay. Lyophilized. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Wild. Lyophilized kratom tea as a therapeutic option for opioid dependence. That was that appeared in uh, Drug and Alcohol Dependence Journal this year, and all the authors are from the University of Florida, uh, most from the Department of Pharmacodynamics. Um, this is the university that has uh, received, in 2018, they got $3.5 million from the NIDA, and in 2019, they got $3.4 million both to study Kratom. I'm glad you brought that up, yeah, because this University of Florida does come up continually, um, and it looks like, you know, they did work with people at Harvard Medical School and Mississippi, but more or less the, at least it mentioned in the methods, the Mississippi was there to validate um, and verify that Kratom was actually the plant that they were using uh, in the experiment, right? So it, it does appear that these were mostly performed by University of Florida. Um, and, and you're right, that, that have been putting in a lot of the groundwork um, for, for scientific studies of Kratom. Yeah, Christopher McCurdy worked on this. His name, I think uh, Wilson is the first name, but um, McCurdy is the, one of the first guys that I heard when I started Googling Kratom science. Um, mm -hmm. He was He's given interviews and stuff, and he was showing... He, he worked on salvia for a couple of years, and then he, um, he... I think he was doing a study in general about legal drugs, and he just started discovering stuff about Kratom, Along the lines of what's in this study, like it seems to be a safer pain management alternative. And uh, his right. wife uh, was Bonnie Avery who worked on this, and she passed away in 2019 of cancer. So that was a, oh. that was a loss to the science community. But uh, yeah. yeah, these guys are uh, have been working on it. I think he stopped giving a lot of interviews because I've definitely uh, tried to get him on the show before. But, um, but yeah, it's good to know they're working on this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, you know, um, this, this study was released very recently, you know, and I view it as sort of the, the next incremental step. And we, we talk about that, especially when you're in graduate school, um, as a PhD, they're saying like, you know, this is the boundary of scientific knowledge. And if you can just like, just slide that forward a little bit. Uh, and everybody's doing that. That's sort of how science progresses. This idea that, you know, you take these giant leaps in scientific understanding. While it does occur, it's the exception, not the rule. Um, and, you know, most of the studies that we have reviewed, um, I'd say it's about 50-50 with like behavioral neuroscience and then the, the socio-demographic ones. But, but collectively, all of them um, uh, identify this need for very basic behavioral pharmacology studies um, using time proven methods um, just to just to lay down the most basic uh, baseline in, in kratom uh, activity and, and physiology. And I essentially view this paper as just that. You know, I remember when we first started doing the journal club, you'd ask, or, or we'd have Twitter questions come in, and they would ask about like, you know, what what. Uh, active constituent of kratom, what alkaloid can lead to these effects um, or this effect or that effect. And, and it basically the answer is we don't know. No one's done the sort of baseline studies. So the study that we're looking at here essentially, um, you know, got kratom. Uh, how do we say this word? Lyophilized. <laughs> lyophilized. So yeah. they, they made kratom tea and they lyophilized it, which is essentially a process just for removing the water. 
um, you freeze it down to you know liquid nitrogen way down and then you um, pull off the water or sublimate the water out uh, without having to raise the heat which heat could potentially modify the alkaloid content right so it's basically like dehydrating kratom tea uh, down to the active components so they did that and then they evaluated uh, uh, mice um, on a number of just like classical behavioral tests so they looked at um, the pain relief activity with a warm water tail assay they looked for locomotor impairment on a uh, rotor rod then they did respiratory depression and uh, hyperlocomotion or, or more uh, movement activity um, in a basically a behavioral box. Um, and then they looked for condition place preference. So uh, that's an indication of, of addiction or addiction potential, the reward there. Um, and so with all of these tests that they did, you know, they're just classic behavioral neuroscience. And so it's not like it pushed the ground in terms of we learned something new. Um, it just laid the sort of baseline to say all of these things that uh, were being reported in survey literature by, uh, you know, the ethnobotanist and the, the actual human users um, do show out in uh, tried and true behavioral methods um, when, when we do it in the mice and rats. Um, and we can go into more details on each of those tests if you want, um, but I just wanted to lay that broad uh, perspective out there because it's it's uh, important to understand that all of these like almost every single drug that we have has gone under has has been given to mice who have gone under these tests or a variation of these tests um, and it established it it, it, it it finally brings a baseline for kratom up to par with with certain other controlled substances or not controlled substances um, active substances yeah yeah that was a good overview and i definitely have it all broken down into sections with with uh kind of questions in each one and I, I mm -hmm. actually, they, the way they made it, I spent like way too much time Googling the type of filter they use and all this stuff. So I'm going to get, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, Lyophilized. Lyophilized um, Kratom tea. So they basically made tea. They got about, they got 200 grams of Kratom, which was um, about seven ounces they were added to a Finum T filter. Now this is a big. They have a really large size. It's a German company. They're natural fiber filters, and it looks like an envelope. It's like a pocket with mm -hmm. a flap, mm -hmm. and uh, the largest ones are about like eight point eight by four inches, and it's it's enough to fit about seven ounces of kratom in there. They said they boiled it two hundred grams of kratom in a filter. It said that they boiled it, but I'm thinking they might have simmered it because I've heard that boiling can kill the alkaloids. Is that even true? You know, I haven't heard that. And it was boiled for 20 minutes. I think, you know, um, adding heat is what, you know, my default mode would be in sort of making tea. And it's funny that you Googled that tea bag because I did the exact same thing. What's the spinum yeah. tea filter? Um, yeah. But, you know, that's where the University of Mississippi came in. So once they had this uh, Kratom tea, they sent a sample of it off to um, an analytical lab who then they did ultra high performance uh, liquid chromatography um, just to verify the content of a Kratom alkaloids, right? So um, it is, of course, possible that the amount of those alkaloids was affected by that 20 minutes of boiling. But ultimately, at the end of the day, they had a known amount of the alkaloids in each of these doses. And, and that's, that's an important factor for this study, I think, with the known amount. I was just like, you know, I could probably try this at home because all they did was evaporate the water off. <laughs> so I, well, of I think they, there is some um, there is some like uh, freezing um, as yeah. part of the process, okay. but it, it more or less is an evaporation. Right. Yeah. So they got out of seven ounces of Kratom. They got 60 grams of that e extract after evaporation. Another I'm, I'm looking at materials and methods here. And another um, question I had, they had. Male and gene disrupted knockout mice for the mu kappa and delta opioid receptors. What what are knockout mice? I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad you brought this up because I looked into these particular mice. Uh, they're from Jackson Laboratory up in Maine, which is if not the biggest, um, at least in the top two or three of uh, scientific animal. Um, providers, right? So the C57BL6J uh, uh, are basically just a standard 
genetic line of mice that are used across the board in, in behavioral studies, uh, even in genetic studies, hormonal studies. So they're just do the quote unquote control, the normal. These yeah. gene disrupted mice essentially have um, the, the code in the DNA that produces or um, transcribes into the mu opiate receptor or the kappa opiate receptor or the delta opiate receptor is disrupted to the point where they have far, far less of these receptors in their brain, mm. um, or it is completely non-functional. And so it's a way to say, is this receptor critical for the behavioral effects that we're viewing um, by knocking out or removing those receptors? So it's, you know, it's, it's a pretty slick way to do it. And there are so many knockout mice available. Um, you could get it for almost every, you know, as long as it's non-lethal um, and, and they don't exhibit sort of uh, vastly different baseline activity, um, you, you can usually find them. Of uh, worth noting though, these mice, for one of these mice with a mu opiate uh, receptor knockout, can be anywhere from $250 per mouse to like $3,000 per wow. mouse. Um, and so it's just, uh, I mentioned that because one of the people always ask me all the time, why would we do zebrafish? And that cost right there is exactly why. It's yeah. a you know, you're working with a $250,000 animal that, you know, is being well taken care of, but ultimately is there to produce, you know, the data and, and science. Yeah. So, I mean, it's like there goes all the NIDA grant money on those mice. Yeah, exactly. You know, and I don't I don't have the exact number on me, but I'm, I'm pretty sure in most of these studies there was like between 10 to 20 of these mice. Um, and so, yeah, I was actually shocked and, and I, you know, almost am continued to shock to this day. I, I don't think a lot of people really understand how expensive science is. Like it's yeah. uh, ridiculously expensive. I mean, plus you got to pay all the highly trained scientists, you know. <laughs> well, you know, yes, but, you know, uh, it's not the most uh, lucrative uh, field to be in. Um, and you have access to tons of uh, eager and willing student uh, interns who want to learn. Yeah. Um, but you're paying, let's say you want to get like a specialized spatula stainless steel that has antimicrobial properties or something, you know, you could be spending a hundred bucks on just a little, you know, screwdriver looking thing. Um, yeah. and, and that's across the board. How do they knock the receptors out of the mice? There's a bunch of different ways to do that. Um, I think the one that comes to mind to me, um, because it's just been in the news is a CRISPR Cas9. Um, but that's a mostly a recent, uh, uh, genetic editing tool. And it's, and it's, um, uh, more about sort of not having to be tied to a specific gene. You can sort of insert and excerpt exactly where you want it to be. When it comes down to these specific receptors, another way you could do that, essentially, broadly speaking, and there's, you know, there's a bunch of different ways, but you know that the, uh, the beginning of the receptor starts here, the end of it starts here, and you know the whole genetic sequence. So you can introduce enzymes that essentially mirror that exact sequence and then bind to it and never, it could be a permanent binding. So when the DNA unwraps and it starts getting transcribed into RNA, it can't do that because there's a permanent binding now on that uh, particular genetic sequence. Um, you know, there are other ways with viruses and vectors. There's ways where you could do it where you're not necessarily targeting the, the DNA, but you're targeting the RNA, or maybe you're targeting just uh, in, an ineffective protein or making the protein ineffective. Um, so I'm not particularly sure exactly how it was done in these mice, but yeah. it's, uh, it's been around for a while. Uh, that's interesting. Um, so I'm on like section 2.3. It's the dosing. Uh, the thing I, uh, the thing that I thought was cool in this study was they actually gave the mice a dose that is uh, kind of a human. It's it would be equivalent in a human. Um, it right. says uh, the test dose of LKT. That's lyophilized, lyophilized, lyophilized kratom tea. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh so the test dose of LKT used in the and we're going to be calling it LKT for the rest of the time everybody <laughs> using the present mouse studied was calculated using the FDA recommended guidelines from the normalized dose of mitragynine 56.7 milligrams available in a glass of kratom juice consumed by the native kratom users from Malaysia 
So they made sure to calculate for human equivalent dose. Um, and then, yeah, like I said, other tests, you know, gave them like 900 milligrams or whatever. And it kind of, they in some of these tests I read, they got results that were, you know, toxic results because they gave them such high doses of my trigenine. Right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we call this translation, uh, uh, like scientific translation. And that's why it was important for them. Once they had the LKT and they sent it off to the University of Mississippi to characterize the amounts with the analytical chemistry, um, knowing that allowed them to make this human equivalent dose. Um, so essentially, yeah, they said this is what it typically a human consumes in the glass of, of kratom juice or tea. Uh, let's just, you know, do the simple math, the ratio math to say, uh, this is the equivalent dose in a mouse to make it uh, relevant and translatable up the up the animal uh, tree. Here's another word. Uh, I have it right here. Antinociception. Antinociception. So it's uh, antinociceptive characterization. Uh, it says 55 degrees Celsius warm water tail withdraw assay. So can you explain what happens in this assay? Uh, yeah, for sure. So the 55 okay. uh, degrees Celsius, I think, is like 130 degrees Fahrenheit, more or less. Um, and this is like a tail flick test with a hot plate. But essentially, the antinociception is um, pain relief or pain blocking. And the idea being that if they're um, currently uh, getting antinociception effects, their tail will remain in the hot water or on the hot plate for longer. Um, they, the sort of heat stress or heat pain that's communicated to the brain is being blocked by the opiates. Uh, therefore, they keep their tail there longer without moving it to avoid, you know, getting burned or whatever. So essentially, yeah, they, they, they dip the tail in the hot water uh, in this study. They measure how long it takes them to remove the tail just at baseline. And then they administered, you know, either morphine or, the, or different doses of the LKT. And they did this to both the normal mice and the knockout mice um, with the primary measure being latency to move the tail out. The longer the latency, the more uh, pain relieving or pain blocking effects are interpreted. And so what they did, um, they to test respiratory depression and local motor activity is uh, randomly grouped mice were habituated in an individual chambers for 60 minutes, then administered morphine, LKT, or vehicle, which is just the saline. Uh, mm -hmm. Animals moved freely inside the chamber for three hours where respiration, breaths per minute, and ambulation number of photo beam breaks were counted. So now they're counting for respiratory depression what actually happens to like a human who experiences respiratory depression isn't that what causes uh, overdose deaths right yeah yeah so um i thought I, I thought you were going to mention something about clams which is what they called this uh sort of box that they put the animals in comprehensive lab animal monitoring system okay and so the the animal goes in there i've never heard it called clams before by the way <laughs> interesting uh kind of funny. analogy there but so they, yeah, they put them into this, uh, into this box, into this container that has a bunch of different uh, sensors all around it that can collect the data automatically over time. Um, and so I'm not particularly sure we could dig in if we wanted to, but uh, respiration could be detected with cameras based on just watching the, the width of the body change. Um, mm -hmm. It could also be detected uh, like based on vibrations that are recorded through the floor plate. Um, mm. there, you know, there also could be, and I don't think it was so in this case, but there are little like bands you can wrap around the animals to get the respiratory rate, but essentially, um, all the classic opiates, uh, lead to, um, slower, um, and not as deep, uh, respiration. And you're right. Um, this is one of the biggest risks or the risk with, with overdosing on opiates is that you repress your breathing so much that you essentially die of suffoc suffocation. The automatic system that drives your lungs and breathing is essentially depressed to the point where it's not sending those signals. But it's, you know, down in your spinal cord, there's um, areas that control your heart rate, that control uh, your respiration rate. And when you depress those areas of the brainstem, uh, it can lead to dangerous effects. So, and, and it's also, you know, I think that what they were doing here was essentially trying to understand, does the L LT, uh, LKT, the Kratom, 
lead to the same amount of respiratory depression using human equivalent doses in mice compared to the morphine. And is there something that happens um, in the uh, like opioid, like the MOR that uh, causes the respiratory depression? With the with the animals that they used, so they had just normal baseline animals, the C you know number animals that were given morphine or several different doses, human equivalent doses of the LKT, the kratom. And then they also had a line of rats that had these receptors knocked out. And so what you see essentially is the normal rat who takes, who gets the morphine has X amount, let's say it's just 10 amount of respiratory depression. The same rat without the opiate receptors doesn't have that respiratory depression. And then the uh, mice that were given just the kratom had some respiratory depression, but it was not as severe as uh, the morphine and it responded in a dose dependent manner. Meaning that, and I just want to double check to make sure that's right. I'm pretty sure it was a response that they saw in a dose dependent manner. Just meaning that the more kratom you take, the more uh, respiratory depression is observed, but it's still not as uh, severe as it is in morphine. Okay, so Rotorod, what is a Rotorod? It sounds like a ride at Kennywood or a, a, like a really <laughs> like a really nice Valentine's Day gift. A Rotorod is essentially a, a spinning bar, circular bar that has dividers up on it so you can set a rat on the bar while it spins. And you're primarily measuring um, how long it takes before the animal falls off the spinning rod. Um, so, you know, the amount of, from the time they were on to the time they hit this little button as they fall off, it's not like a big fall, you know, it's a couple inches. Um, but you can, you know, there's different modifications you can do. You can change the speed at which the rod is spinning, um, or you could use different drug treatments. And essentially you're just looking at like, does uh, this, um, you know, does this target compound modify coordinated locomotion, um, which is slightly different from uh, the amount of locomotion. Okay. So are you like kind of getting the mice dizzy and then they fall no, over no. or something? No. So they don't spin. It's spin. The rod spins. And so like you literally, you pick up the mouse, you put it on a rod. Think of like a shower rod. It's essentially yeah. that usually there's rubber on it. Um, but you just set them on it while it's spinning and they walk and hold on for as long as they can before they fall off and just hit a little lever that, that, you know, stops the timer. Oh, okay. Okay. Latency the fall. So that explains that. That explains that. Um, and, and they, they gave them, they habituated them to the road rod. Uh, they were administered saline, morphine, or LKT 15 minutes prior to assessment and accelerated speed trials performed every 10 minutes. So based on this, it looks like the, uh, they're, they're measuring, they're graphing it over time. So how long since they were administered the drug and then the latency to fall. And what you see is that the lifelice Kratom T uh, rats fall, like stayed on the rotor rod longer than uh, the ones that were treated with uh, morphine with the U five fit or U fifty, as well as one gram uh, per kilogram. So a high dose of kratom T looked like the morphine, where they fell off rather quickly. A lower dose of forty five milligrams per kilogram, uh, they were able to almost double the amount of time that they were on that rotor rod. And so it's it's an indication that um, lower doses or human equivalent doses of the LKT don't uh, affect your ability to have coordinated motor activity, um, but also provide the pain relieving benefits. And then if you take more and more and more, then it starts to affect uh, like the classical opiates. And, and, and it's also what makes opiates, the standard opiates, a liability. So you've got the you know, respiratory depression, you've got the uh, um, uh, addiction potential, you know, you've got uh, just, you know, misuse broadly, there's a whole other side effects. And so, yes, it's, we're going after what people are reporting, but we're also trying to evaluate, you know, if there was a pro and con list of opiates, uh, is it the same for Kratom in terms of that con list? And if it's not, then it suggests that it's a, a better alternative for the task at hand than going right to the classic opiates. And it also, they did um, condition, condition place preference tests. What is the uh, significance of those tests and how does that translate into uh, effects in humans? 
Yeah. So CPP, uh, again, like the Rotorod, you know, is a behavioral test assay that has been around for ages. It's like a standard, you know, standard issue in behavioral pharmacology. Essentially, you have a, comp uh, a compartment uh, or a cage or an arena where uh, a mouse is put into the back of the box or the front of the box, just put into a, the, the main area of the box. And then there's two other rooms off that main area. You go into one room and you're given uh, the opiate or the drug of interest. You go into another room and you're not given that, uh, that drug. So one room gives you the drug and which room that is, how much drug it is, that can all change. But the idea being is if this compound uh, can, the rewarding effects can lead to physical dependence or addiction, they'll end up spending more time in the room where they're getting the drug versus the other room. Um, you know, when both rooms are, are no drug, they sort of spend equal time between the rooms. But if there's a, a, a potentially addictive compound in one of the rooms, they spend more time in that room. Um, interestingly, there's been several studies recently that have come out to show like, you know, the condition place preference sort of, you know, they get a choice, drug or no drug. Um, but that's it. There's not like water or food or other mice in the cage with them. They just sort of they're alone and that's what they have to do. They found that if you did a condition, uh, condition place preference in a mouse that's with other mice, they'll repeatedly choose social activity over uh, opiates or cocaine uh, or alcohol or nicotine. So having, that, having the other mice in the, in the cage reduces the amount of time that they spend at this uh, sort of uh, room that gives them the rewarding uh, behavior. And so, you know, it's just interesting to think, Broadly, as that relates to humans, you know, you go back to places that make you feel good, where you feel comfortable, um, where you can score, you know, your next uh, bag or whatever when it comes to, to opiate use or pills, I guess it would be. Um, but and, you know, if the, the longer you spend in that area, the longer amount of time, the more sort of physical dependence liability there is. But of course, Humans aren't put in a box where they're given one of two choices. And if you were alone in a box where you have one box that gave you something that felt good and one box that didn't, of course, you're going to sort of spend more time in there. Humans are part of a community. And, and what's coming out of this condition place preference research, especially with the social aspect in it, is that community and having a community is one of the most powerful uh, deterrents from continual use of these uh, pleasurable or rewarding compounds. And so you know, it, in my mind, it makes me think of, uh, you know, support groups, um, Al-Anon or uh, Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. They create that community uh, of understanding and sort of uh, shared experience that is probably what helps people not go back to the, their drug of choice more than anything else, more than any pharmacological intervention. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting um, uh, to see how that, that comes into play. And it's only been recently where someone was like, hey, so, you know, humans are with other people all the time. So are mice. What, what would happen if we put the other mice in this condition place preference? Um, I think, and, it, you know, we don't have a fact check here, uh, but I, I think that the only thing that uh, would keep the mice in the room uh, where they get the compound versus spending time with the other mice or rats was uh, sugar. And so essentially that it, it would postulate or lay out that sugar is the most addictive molecule um, or set of <laughs> molecules on the planet, more than cocaine, more than opiates. I mean, it's the only <laughs> one that a mouse would choose rather than hanging out with his buddies. I could be wrong there, but uh, I'm in the right ballpark. <laughs> I keep trying to tell my wife that every time she makes cookies, but uh, you know, she, <laughs> she likes making cookies, man. As far as that test, it says uh, morphine produced significant condition place preference. In contrast, LKT demonstrated no significant difference from preconditioning responses after place conditioning. And that kind of goes along with um, some of the um, some of the social uh, studies that uh, Dr. Singh did with with um, social functioning and, and morphine, uh, yeah. morphine addicts versus, uh, you know, people who take kratom their social functioning is is just like a sober person's i think there definitely is an aspect of kratom that leads to like facilitating social interaction mm -hmm. um i don't know i haven't really read anything about like kratom users spending more time with other people in a social setting 
you know, that was sort of a, analogous to what we were talking about with, with the condition place preference. Um, what this particular uh, study shows, and the, the figure six graph lays it out just like perfect, is that the rats that were given the option of morphine uh, were in that side of the uh, room for 220 seconds more uh, than, you know, than zero when it was just equal between the two rooms. Whereas with Kratom, uh, the low dose of, yeah, lower dose um, had it around maybe 50. And then the higher dose was even lower than that, like around 40. Um, there's mm -hmm. a margin of error there, but like it, they spend significantly less time in the uh, room that gives them the compound. And it just suggests that Kratom is not as immediately physically addictive as morphine. And um, it says uh, evaluation of LT. LKT physical dependence and amelioration of opioid withdrawal. That's uh, 3.3. It says uh, escalating doses of morphine induced physical dependence uh, demonstrated by administration of naloxone. In contrast, daily escalated, escalating doses of LKT kratom followed by naloxone produced few significant withdrawal signs confirming reduced LKT physical dependence. Yeah, so, so we've talked about these induced withdrawal um, studies several times, right? Give yeah. them the compound on a set schedule and then hit them with naloxone and understand if they're experiencing withdrawal symptoms. And so they were looking at jumping frequency and teeth chattering. Uh, those are signs in mice of withdrawal. And it's very analogous to what we did with the zebrafish where it was erratic movements. So induced withdrawal and how often are they just sort of spinning out of control, like jumping frequency, teeth chattering frequency. And so, um, yeah, behaviorally, they saw very, uh, they saw um, much less jumping frequency and much less significant, statistically significant, less teeth chattering in the mice that were um, habituated and given, you know, a, a long uh, schedule of the LKT versus uh, the morphine. Um, so, you know, it's, it, this is a behavioral test and we talked about how behavioral endpoints, you know, have their parallels, there's translation ability. The one thing that they didn't do um, that I had mentioned before is like, they could have also measured cortisol or corticosterone actually in these uh, rodents because that's a stress hormone and it would be indicated of a physiological response alongside of uh, a behavioral response. Um, it's fine, you know, they, they did a whole slew of behavioral tests that as I said at the beginning, had to be done to just sort of lay the groundwork. And then, you know, then you have a graduate student who will come in and say, well, let's do the same test uh, with induced withdrawal with the Kratom T with morphine and naloxone. And let me also then measure whole body corticosterone levels after it and see if the behavior matches the physiology. Prolonged treatment over four days with LKT significantly ameliorated all subsequent symptoms of naloxone precipitated oth opioid withdrawal. So if people don't remember, a lot of people know what Narcan is. That's what you mm -hmm. give to somebody who's overdosing. Well, that's just naloxone, and what they're doing is they're, it reduces the effects of opioids. I mean, it, it'll give these mice opioid withdrawal, so they're going to measure... In this, in this case, they're measuring what methadone or LKT uh, oh, they, right. they did for withdrawal. And it says, tapering the doses of LKT given over four days still significantly reduced naloxone precipitated measures of opioid withdrawal just as effectively as the repeated high doses. So that's interesting. You can, you can start with a high dose of Kratom and then taper down and you'll still get through the withdrawal the same as significant high doses. So I've heard from a lot of people who have used it for withdrawal and opioid since cessation say that they started off taking a lot of Kratom, that then they tapered down with the same uh -huh. effects, and they'd say something like less is more. And and that's another reason where it's it seems like a safer pain management tool because you can you don't have to take a lot to get the same um, get the same effects, and you can and it's easily manageable. Right, right. Yeah. So we're, uh, you know, essentially taking what people have reported and putting it to the test in mice. And yeah, when you induce that withdrawal after, you know, a schedule a couple weeks or, or days, they give the whole schedule here, but an extended treatment or exposure to morphine, you induce the withdrawal, and then you provide the LKT, the Kratom after that, they see less jumping frequency, they see less teeth chattering. 
So they're seeing less overt behavioral signs of an intense or severe withdrawal syndrome uh, when they when they administer the kratom. And so, you know, yes, uh, this essentially says what was reported by the humans as uh, what they would do to get off of opiates or opiate cessation uh, is also very clearly and statistically significantly found in rodents in our standard uh, behavioral uh, models or assays. And so, you know, it's, it's one thing to have studies that say that this is what humans report as, but now there's actually some hard data with statistical significance and, and proper controls, um, including even knocking out genes um, to say that is born true in the behavioral data. Now um, let's, you know, let's dig and learn more. Now that we see uh, the, the, the behavior in mice is matching exactly what, or at least, you know, it's the analogous to what humans are reporting. And they even say these results are consistent with a study in 2008, published case study of individuals self-treating opioid addiction and withdrawal with tea brewed from the leaves of kratom. And it's just a lot of, there's tons of stuff on the internet, um, just personal testimonials that, that say mm -hmm. as much. Yeah, and you know, I'm looking at table three here now. The tables were below the figures, but it wasn't just jumping frequency and teeth chattering they were measuring as indicators of, of withdrawal or withdrawal behavior. They did four paw tremors, so the front paws sort of shaking, wet dog shakes, which would be whole body, you know, sort of shaking, body uh, straightening, so stretching out as far as you can, uh, presence of diarrhea, jumping frequency, rearing frequency, four paw licking frequency, and teeth chattering frequency. Um, so they, you know, it was probably in a behavioral observation container and either uh, uh, a, a lab tech watched the behavior and, and tallied up all of these things happening, or uh, they had some automated video analysis software like Noldis, for example, um, that is, or Clever Systems is another one that is able to detect when these specific behaviors happen from a video of the mouse inside of the chamber. And you know, it makes me feel better too that they're looking at an, all of these different behavioral endpoints rather than just those two. Um, and again, I would suggest if we compare it with some physiological uh, uh, evidence as well, it would sort of be the, the nail in the coffin on, yes, uh, kratom and the compounds in kratom uh, provide relief from uh, morphine withdrawal. Yeah, and they even conclude with this study suggests that kratom tea and or the alkaloid components it contains could be prime candidates for the treatment of pain and opioid physical dependence. So that comes back to the question as why hasn't it, why hasn't that happened yet? Um, I know McCurdy has, I remember hearing him talk in interviews about why it's so hard to study. Um, does it have to do with the fact that kratom is a, we might have talked about this before, I don't want to repeat ourselves, but the fact that Kratom is a plant and it's harder for a drug company to patent? Yes, that's a factor, of course. Um, I think the um, lack of studies, like the one that we just reviewed today, was holding things up. You know, even if, even if we all sort of, and, and you want to go into science not sort of uh, with assumptions on what's going to happen, but uh, up until this study was published, there wasn't sort of a, a published study or set of studies that you could reference in, let's say, a grant application or an FDA, initiating an FDA uh, clinical trials. Now you can point to this study and say, boom, 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 these behavioral tests have been done in mice. We now need to move up uh, the evolutionary tree. Uh, we could do it in humans. Um, but the studies like these, just the fact that they didn't exist, at least to this extent or this comprehensive with using all of the classical tests, was holding things up. Um, so, you know, this represents a good step towards providing that foundation, as I've been mentioning, to, to get closer to actually having therapeutics and Kratom uh, be prescribed in these types of situations in the clinic. Um, I do think that the flip side of that is, of course, the amount of time and the costs that it takes to get approval to treat specific uh, conditions in the United States via prescription um, or, you know, professional medical assistance where their inability to sort of control um, or have, uh, you know, a, a, a amount of time where they're the limited ownership of that compound um, certainly is dissuading any pharmaceutical company uh, from entering the space. So, you know, it costs a lot. They got to look at the potential reward there. Um, 
And, you know, thankfully, uh, and I, you know, it's knock on wood, but like people do have access to this as a natural plant compound and the amount of options that are coming out are, are growing. Um, so in, in, to some extent, and you see this with, with, uh, you know, drug addiction, some people, and, and it's, you know, people can be embarrassed about wanting to go to the doctor and essentially saying, I need help. Um, yeah. I'm addicted and I can't control it anymore. And so the ability to um, sort of self uh, guide your your ride off of that uh, roller coaster, um, you know, is, is there and, and people sometimes prefer it, you know, the only the only star and asterisk I would mention there is like, if you have community support, the chances of avoiding a relapse are significantly, significantly higher. Um, so you know, you may not, you may feel bad about going to the doctor and, and saying something about your, your fearful of addiction, but you, you should, and I would encourage you to be able to talk about that to the people that are closest to you, um, because they provide that community aspect and, and you really need it to have long lasting effects. Definitely. And, and it's not illegal to be addicted to something either. So it's, you know, it, it's, <laughs> cause a lot of people don't, want to admit uh, an addiction because uh, you know they they're afraid their doctor's going to call the cops or something like that yeah and it's unfortunate i mean it's it's uh i think maybe something particularly pronounced in the u.s where uh this uh notion of addiction is some sort of legal issue uh and associated with some sort of cramp criminality um or you know, weak character or, you know, lack of self-control, all these behavioral things. But like when it comes to opiate addiction, there's a very strong and very clear biological, physiological aspect that does not care who you are, where you live, how much money you make, uh, what you do, uh, 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 like when you're not doing the opiates. And uh, yeah, the luckily we're seeing the conversation switch to addiction is a medical issue and it's not something that we should shame it's something that we should provide help with the people that, uh, you know, ask for help. Luckily that's changing. And, you know, luckily, uh, studies like this and, and hopefully, you know, our efforts to get the word out about studies like this to the broader populace will help sort of shovel this, um, road to being an official treatment and, and really helping people a little bit faster. You know, that's why I think, uh, you and I, and like people like the AKA, um, put in the effort to spread the news and, and support and, uh, uh, sort of um, disseminate or educate as many people as we can about the studies that are being done effectively, like as soon as they're published. I mean, I don't know the exact date, but I, I saw this in my Twitter feed and I think it was this week a preprint came out. So we're, you yeah. know, we're trying to stay on top of things um, and get the information out there uh, just for people to, uh, the more people that are, that are pushing for something to happen, uh, the more likely it is to happen. Thank you, Dr. Jonathan Cachet. Check out Dr. Cachet's work at the Cannabis Museum and ccvresearch.com and look him up on YouTube. The Kratom Science Podcast is written and produced by me, Brian Gallagher, for kratomscience.com. Music is Captain Big Wheel. The song is called Moonrunner. Take care.